The Paul Leslie Interviews. The man we're talking to is Mari Yeston, but I will call him Mari. Thank you. <laughs> so who is Mari Yeston? <laughs> well, I, I'm an American uh, composer and lyricist from New Jersey, and I write music, I write lyrics. I've had a career and continue to have a career as a teacher, as a professor. I have a doctorate from Yale in uh, music theory, and I before that I went to Yale as an undergraduate, and I went to Cambridge in England for a couple of years on a fellowship. I taught there. I guess I was the head of the undergraduate music program there for a number of years, all the while writing, I guess, Broadway shows. And now I've also spent over 20 years teaching the BMI Music Theater Workshop here in New York, in which I've had wonderful uh, people in there who have uh, done exceedingly well, people who wrote Avenue Q, Next to Normal, shows like uh, the, the authors of uh, various shows, uh, Aaron's and Flaherty, for example, have written so many wonderful shows. They all started out in that in that workshop. And I started out in that workshop under the teacher Lehman Engel, who taught me when I was a young writer, and Alan Menken, my good friend, and Ed Kleban, who ended up writing a Cars line. So there's a long tradition in that workshop here in New York. And you grew up in a very musical family. Oh, so, good goodness, yes, I did. Tell us about the music you heard growing up that you most enjoyed. Well, you know, well, yeah, that's a great question. I think when you've grown up in the 50s and the early 60s, I think that was a golden age that will never, ever again be repeated. And here's, I guess I have an analysis of that. My mother's father was a cantor in the synagogue, and my mom played the classical piano very beautifully. My dad came from London, and so he brought with him a whole world of English, not only English folk music, but English music hall, vaudeville. My dad had a business up in uh, Montreal, Canada, and we used to go there when I was very little, so I had a lot of interaction with French music, Edith Piaf, and things like that. Those, those are my earliest years. I started playing the piano myself when I was five, and Mom gave me my first lessons, and I got my first classical piano teacher when I was six, and I started writing, composing then. I, w I won my first little com composition award when I was seven. But here's the thing. Growing up in the 1950s, everybody who came to of age, even as a little kid in that era, really had the advantage of an explosion of music that will never again happen because the long playing record had been invented. Television was coming into its own and radio was really coming into its own. And so you had an overwhelming tsunami of different kinds of music that had never again, never before been experienced. Try to imagine with the long playing record, every note of music that had ever been written go back to the Middle Ages was suddenly available to you. So you could go to the record store and you could buy all the Beethoven symphonies and Bartok and Hindemith, and you could also buy all of Jerry Mulligan and Miles Davis and Thelonious Monk and Charlie Parker and, and, and everything up to the modern jazz quartet and Count Basie and, and Duke Ellington, the whole world of jazz. And it was also the golden age of the Broadway musical. You could go out and get sound of music. And it was also the golden age of the beginning of rhythm and blues and rock. You listened to Shaboom Shaboom and all, all the early doo-wop music and then lived through that radical, wonderful folk period, folk music period of Peter, Paul, and Mary and Bob Dylan and folk rock. And then, of course, the Beatles. And try to imagine that all of these musics are happening to you at the same time. Plus, world music, you would go out and buy an album by Miriam Makiba, and, and you'd hear the music of, of, of uh, Indian instrument and African music and Caribbean music. It'll never again be that, because you see, in those days, there was no division between music that you listened to. All music was great music. So I come from one generation in which it would be impossible to say, what your favorite music is, because it was the golden age of the American popular song, the golden age of rock and roll, the golden age of jazz, the golden age of Broadway, the golden age of classical music. And it was just a thrilling time to grow up where it was one musical discovery after another, and it never ended. Can you kind of remember the first time you, you wrote a song or composed something? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I think the first time I wrote a little piano piece when I was about six and a half years old, I still have it written down somewhere. I remember writing it down. That process have ne has never stopped. I think I've I've known I was a writer of music and a writer of lyrics ever since before I was nine years old. 
And it just seemed like a natural thing for me to do in my inner life. And, and I've just kept doing it in various media. And, and as I say, I, I, don't, I don't see any division or snob appeal or between writing a classical piece or writing a, or writing a, a jazz tune or, or, or playing jazz or playing a club date or writing a Broadway song or a pop tune or a ballet. To me, it all comes from the same source, which is, you know, from within my heart and what I hear singing in my head. Did you like to read and write growing up? Oh, golly, I did. I just read for voraciously. My dad was a brilliant man, and he was a, an autodidact. He, he just knew everything from just reading, and he inculcated that in me. So did my mom, and I just read from the time I could read everything from, you know, you know what, from the Bible all the way through to uh, every novel that I could get my hands on. I read comic books. I loved reading. Com I loved reading classic comic books. I would read A Tale of Two Cities, and that would inspire me to read the book. And starting, I guess, when I was about ten, eleven, and twelve, I fell in love with poetry. And I fell in love with the poetry of not only English language but other languages. And I fell in love with light verse. I fell in love with limericks and with Hilaire Belloc, the cautionary verses. And of course, I fell in love with lyrics. I had been taken when, as a young kid, to see My Fair Lady the original production, and that just, I think, seeing that really made me want to write like that, to write a Broadway show. And so I, I loved reading anything I could get my hands on. You mentioned My Fair Lady. Oh, yeah. Which you saw as a young guy. What did you like about that experience? Well, I think the first thing about My Fair Lady was, I, and I remember I was very young, and I saw Rex Harrison, and I, I saw Julie Andrews. I think probably... Coming away from it, the first thing that stunned me was the visual of it. It was a famous show at the Mark Hellinger Theater. There were two turntables, and it was this incredible designs by Cecil Beaton, and it really just knocked your eyes out. It was just a world that, that you could not imagine in which you can be transported in a theater. The theater is really kind of a magic box, just transported away to some extraordinary place. I think probably the second thing that really got straight through to my gut was the voice of Julie Andrews, who couldn't have been more than 23, 24 years old, I'm guessing now. But oh my goodness, what a riveting, thrilling experience to hear that young, brilliant new voice live in the theater. And we're all now familiar with it, but try to imagine it's something brand new that you've never heard before. And of course, the overwhelming stage presence of Rex Harrison Everything about that show, the melody, the wit of the lyrics, the dancing, the design, the costumes, just was, it was an overwhelming experience. And it, it's so often regarded as being, you know, one of the two or three best musicals ever, ever put on stage. And you got to see it first. Oh, yeah. That's... I was a kid. What fascinates you more, lyrics or melodies? Oh, that's a very, uh, equal, they're equally I'm equally, I'm, I'm really, they're both of them, both of them, creating them and appreciating them and studying them are in my DNA. I think I'm just, there's a part of my brain that is literary, that likes to be funny, that likes to play with words, that loves rhymes and rhyming forms. And there's another part of my brain that simply generates music. And I love the interaction of the two. I think it's a very special form. I think that if you go to a Let's say you go to a concert and you hear the Lincoln portrait and somebody is narrating while the orchestra is playing. If you focus on the narration, you miss some of the music. If you focus, if you're listening to the music carefully, you might miss some of the narration. But if you take words and you sing them, then both the words and the music are enhanced and you don't miss one for the other. Song is a unique medium all to itself which illuminates both the words and the music simultaneously. And I think it's that magic connection that so fascinates me. How have your musical tastes changed? Oh, I think my musical tastes have changed in the sense that I never stop discovering and learning new musical vernaculars and new musical languages. I have, I have never once fallen out of love with any music that I fell in love with but I keep on falling in love with new musics. I mean, don't forget, if you look at my lifetime, I lived through the, you know, the advent of bossa nova. 
the advent of Ravi Shankar, the advent of the Beatles. I lived through the advent of atonal music and Elliot Carter and very complicated music and the advent of Terry Riley and Philip Glass and minimalism. And, I, and each time, you know, I, I lived through the advent of hip hop and each time something new happens, I fall in love with that. So it never stops. How important do you think it is for a songwriter to be exposed to a great variety of genres? I think it's essential to not only to be exposed to a great variety of genres, but if you're a songwriter and you're a composer, I think it's essential for you to learn that language, to make it part of your vocabulary. Just like a good film score writer, you never know when you have a, a context or a story or a period or a geographic area in which you need to find exactly the right musical vernacular to address it. And and so I think the more you learn uh, the materials of music, the more you have at your disposal. You know, I like to say, if you only know three chords, you're going to write three chord music. And so knowledge is power when it comes to music and and studying it and learning it. And, and you know, when I was a kid, I would go to the movies and I would run home from the movies and I'd immediately run to the piano and play the film score I just heard. Uh, you know, I remember being a kid and seeing a movie called Taris Bulba with a with a film score by Dmitry Tiomkin. I didn't even think I saw the movie. I went home and I, I ran to the piano and I started playing that film score. And and I remember hearing things on the radio, jazz on the radio. We listened to we listened to a program called Symphony Sid. Oldsters from the New York metropolitan area will remember Symphony Sid. I used to run to the piano and you know play the jazz I heard, and then I played with thrown together jazz groups where I was growing up. You studied music in college. Yeah. What was one of the most important things that you learned from that? That's a great question. I learned two things from studying music in college. The first thing I learned was the value of studying music theory, which is the, the real nuts and bolts and the mechanics of how music works. So that instead of just being at the, at the mercy of your inspiration, you're able to take a look at what you've written, see if you're satisfied with it, wonder if it's not working for you, what's not working and how can you address that? And so the art of writing becomes the, the art of rewriting and having knowledge about the way music is put together helps you understand and rewrite your work and make it better. That's the first most important thing I learned in college. The other thing I learned in college was a whole history of music going back to ancient Greece and the Middle Ages and uh, and learning, uh, coming into contact with pieces of music and composers, filling in my experience, hearing tone poems and hearing the great romantic compositions. All of those things really enlarged my view of the musical universe. I think those were the two really essential things I learned in college. Fascinating stuff. Which composers and lyricists have been the greatest influence on your work? It's interesting. I can, you know, it's funny. You would think that that would be a hard question to answer, but for me, it's a really easy one. There's no question in my mind that the single composer who has had the greatest influence on in my work and who I've been really has guided my inner life musically was, is, and always will be Beethoven. I confronted and encountered the music of Beethoven probably when I was seven or eight years old. I remember by the time I was nine or ten, my mom gave me, I, I played the grooves off them, the nine Beethoven symphonies as were, as conducted by Bruno Walter. And, and to the point of view where I could probably memorize them and sing them. Something about Beethoven beyond any other composer just got into my blood. And I think the reason is, I think the reason is, is that with all of the genius that Mozart was, and all, I always felt that Mozart was a, a beyond all human understanding. I always felt like Mozart's music is kind of like a flower, and, and it's organic, and it's almost like God made it, or it grows out of nature, but no human being could do something that perfect. But with Beethoven, even when I was a kid, I always felt his struggle to will his music into existence. It's always, it's dramatically there in the music somehow. It sounds like the music, a great genius, but a man, a person, a human being could write. And you feel, you feel the content of it. You feel him within that music, pushing it into existence. I've always felt that meant it's possible to aspire to that. And I've always loved Beethoven for that. And insofar as the rest of it goes, I mean, I think probably the lyricist I admire most 
is Frank Lesser, and probably right right next to him, Alan J. Lerner. But Lesser is for me the one who's so universal. He's he's so liked. He doesn't. There's no technique that that's at the surface. He'll get under the skin of a of a secretary or a, or a, or a guy out in California growing who owns a vineyard, and he'll just so easily with his humor and with his humanity just illuminate and warm the character who you're looking at. You just a, just a wonderful free and easy, brilliant. He wears his intellect so lightly. I think he's always been one of my favorite lyricists. What do you think is more important as an artist, being confident or being humble? Oh, you need both. You need both. And they have to they have to war within yourself. You can't write well, you can write from fear. It's very often the case when we're young we do. When we're young we question our own talent. We go, "Oh gee, you know, was that a lucky break or, you know, or am am I really talented? You know, I just wrote something." What is that? Do I really know what I'm doing? At a certain point, you gain a kind of, uh, and so there's a kind of insecurity that you're living with. At a certain point, as you learn your craft, you gain a kind of quiet confidence in your craft. And so there's this, there's constantly an interaction. When you've written something wonderful and you sit down, or you, that people think is wonderful, and you sit down and write something else, you so often want to just write it automatically and say, well, why isn't this working out? And then what you do is you go back and you look at other things that you wrote that worked out well, and you see you've got 30 legal pages of, of, of drafts before you got it right. And you realize that, that it's very often the process of working towards something, making it better and better. So part of you has to have the confidence and the bravado to say, I'm going to try to do something that's never been done. I'm going to, let's say I'm going to write a musical based on the story of the Titanic, for example. And part of you has to have a, a true humility to say, hey, wait a minute, this is going to be hard work and let's not get overconfident and let's not just accept the first idea. Let's try another idea and let's, you know, let's really challenge. You have to challenge yourself to excel. I mean, you cannot imagine how a writer will, will worry about a single note or two in a melody and wonder which one is the best one to pick, or how a, a writer of lyrics will say, should this really be the word and, or should it be the word but, or should it be the word if? In other words, you struggle, and then you struggle over, is this the best vowel to sing on this note of the melody? And all of that stuff is part of the humility of standing before something and knowing that it doesn't necessarily come automatically, and you really, you really have to work. At the same time, you have to say to yourself, "Well, as difficult as this is, yeah, I've been in this situation before, and I've sort of managed to uh, pull through it. And why should this time be any different?" So there's always an interaction of both confidence and a certain very healthy insecurity in writing. Hmm. Did you have any mentors, or for that matter, peers, who helped you develop as a songwriter? Oh, absolutely. I was, I'm the luckiest guy in the world. I mean, first of all, the mentors are all of the great songwriters who I worship. And then in specific, I had a wonderful, I had two wonderful mentors in college. One of them was a music historian and really introduced me to the whole world and history of music and helped me understand it in a wonderful way. And, and one of them was a music theorist who helped me understand how music works. And then I think I, I was very, very lucky that my mentor became Lehman Engel at the Music Theater Workshop in BMI in New York. And Lehman was the dean of Broadway music. He was a great writer. He was the one who conducted Oklahoma, the original production of Oklahoma and all the great musicals in the 50s. And he had a workshop in which he literally studied the great musicals and tried to impart principles of what made them great and what makes theater songs great. He was a genuine, genuine mentor to me. And then when I was a young writer, I was fortunate in meeting Herman Levin, who was the producer of My Fair Lady and Gentlemen Prefer Blonde and The Great White Hope. And he had one of my shows under option, and he introduced me to Alan J. Lerner. And Lerner heard my work and said, it's sort of a magic moment, he said that Oscar Hammerstein used to have him come over his house from time to time to get some pointers, and Alan Lerner suggested that I come to his office every once in a while, and he would give me some pointers, and he did. He he. It was a great privilege to get advice from him. 
I also got some advice from Julie Stein, who was a wonderful, wonderful advice giver, and wonderful advice from Sheldon Harnick, the writer of Fiddler on the Roof, who who was kind of like a musical big brother. So I've been very fortunate in sort of getting a glimpse of some of the greats and in trying the best I can to follow in their footsteps. I'm glad you mentioned Sheldon Harnick. I had the chance to interview him earlier this morning, so this has been quite a morning for me. Yeah, he's such a wonderful man, and he's he's given the world such such a glorious treasure of of words. This is a very hard question for most songwriters. Do you have a favorite song of yours? Oh, that's a tough one. My father's mother, my grandmother, used to say, "How can you choose between your children? It's like fingers on your hand. They're all essential, and they're all the same." So I don't really have a favorite song. I There are some that satisfy you for one reason or some that satisfy you for another reason. So I really, I really, I couldn't answer you. I mean, I could probably give you a bunch of songs that, I, you know, people seem to seem to go for that I, that I love very much. But I would say no, I, I really couldn't answer that question. I mean, it would be, you know, a, kind of a, a sneaky thing to say, the one I'm working on now or the one I hope I'll write next week. But that would be too glib. I think some of the songs that I've written I love because I consider them accomplishments in writing. They were difficult to write. They were interesting assignments. And to pull it off and to watch it work from the stage is deeply satisfying. And some of them, some of your own work you love because it's just, you know, you feel it's a great tune and you love to hear it and you love to sing it. So for different reasons, you know, there'll probably be different songs that, that of mine that, that I'm glad I wrote and that appeal to me. What about show? Is there maybe a favorite show of yours? That's hard, too, because each show is a world. One of the things you learn about musical theater is that there really is no formula. In fact, I really think that every genuinely good, new, fresh musical reinvents the form every time you write it. I think that My Fair Lady and Sweeney Todd are completely different animals, and they had to be invented from scratch, from Fiddler on the Roof or... Or bring a dune, for example. And so for me, nine, the language and the style of nine and how that show works on stage is so different from Grand Hotel or Titanic or My Phantom or most recently Death Takes a Holiday. They're structured so differently. The musical style is so different that I couldn't say, again, one is a favorite of the other. I mean, I could say, I guess, of most of the sort of, of, in terms of the sort of symphonic sweep of the score, that would be Titanic. In terms of the, I guess, reality, psychological maturity and reality of the characters in terms of real life, that would have to be nine. I mean, that's a genuine man who's in trouble and a magnificent woman he's married to and, and his mistress, what she goes through. That When I confront that piece, I feel more like it's life on the stage rather than an imitation of life on the stage. For you know, for different reasons, you're happy with different parts of your work. So I couldn't pick a favorite. You mentioned Nine a second ago. Tell us about Nine. What was that experience like for you? Oh, it was magic, particularly because I started writing it when I was in the BMI Music Theater Workshop, and it was really just a, uh, a writing assignment that I gave myself. I didn't think for a second that I would ever get the rights to eight and a half or that it would ever be produced. I wrote it out of love. And I learned from that, and I try to advise others as well. Always write from where you get your best ideas. Write from where you feel the well is 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 giving you, you know, the best, the best, clearest spring of water and inspiration. And I wrote it from love. I wrote it to keep my pencil sharp, and it was just an incredible accident of fate that it it won an award to get a reading, and then it won another award to get a production, and somehow it got to Tommy Tune who said, let's put it on Broadway. And suddenly, I kind of went from nowhere to, you know, a Tony Award for Best Score and two Drama Desk Awards and and the Best Musical of the Year. And, and it was um, it, it was thrilling. And more even more thrilling, of course, was to work with Raul Julia and Tommy Toon and the great Anita Morris and Lillian Montevecchi. It was, and to create the show for them and that process as well was exciting. And to, as well, to innovate what had been a Broadway show in the sense that because we decided we would do it with this one man surrounded by the universe of women in his life, 
I could really treat all of the 24 women on the stage as an orchestra inside his head and write the widest variety of women's choral sounds that I could. I could, I could make them... I could make them nuns, I could make them monks, I could make them all into Ethel Mermans, I could make them all into Sopranos, and it was just a wonderful opportunity to create a palette of choral sound, which I love to write a lot on stage in that show. What did you think of the film, Nine? I loved it. I, I thought, whenever somebody is going to take a piece from one form and put it into another form, as for example, I was blessed to have for me Fellini's permission to make a musical theater piece inspired by his movie because no one could ever remake his movie. It's an auto personal autobiography. So I, it was basically a related story that was inspired by his movie. And of course, I couldn't put a movie on the stage. And similarly, when Rob Marshall did Nine, he was a filmmaker and he couldn't put a stage musical on screen. It had to change. And my feeling was that both the film and the show would have to be independent and that there have to be three independent versions that have very little to do with one another. So never, I never measure the effect of the, of the stage show against the effect of Fellini's great genius masterpiece, nor would I measure the effect of the Rob Marshall film against the nature and the effectiveness of, of the stage show or of Fellini. I think it's, it's, it's not constructive to compare one to the other. And for me, they each work on their own terms. And I love doing them. And the great thing about it is that, is that the stage musical of Nine did nothing to change or to touch the great Fellini masterpiece Eight and a Half. They'll both be have a place, and the film of Nine did nothing to change the stage show. People are doing the stage show right now as we speak somewhere in the world. It has a lot of productions, and it, it's completely unchanged. And so I think part of the reaction to the film were people who love Fellini or who love the stage show who either loved the film's version of it or felt that it, it didn't measure up to what they love about either Fellini or about the stage show. And for me, you know, I, I didn't have that problem. I just loved what Rob did. I thought it was visually brilliant. I thought the, the not only the production values, I thought the, the performances were amazing. Who knew that Penelope Cruz and, oh my God, Marion Cotillard could sing so beautifully. And of course, to work with the wonderful Sophia Loren was, and, and Daniel Day-Lewis was the thrill of a lifetime for me. How did you approach your phantom? Good question. Folks should understand, I, I mean, this news is out there, but we were approached, Arthur and I were approached by Jeffrey Holder to think about Phantom of the Opera long before Andrew Lloyd Webber even had the idea for his Phantom. So we, we preceded that. So I don't think it's hard to understand that in the early 80s, when I was presented with this as, as an idea, I recoiled from it and I said, I think this is a terrible idea because there had never been a musical based on a horror movie. That didn't make any sense to me. I, I thought, well, you know, what are we going to do? Do a musical based on Godzilla meets Mothra next or and then after conversations I read the Gaston Leroux novel and I realized if you don't take this from the various horror movies but instead take a story about a man who was born disfigured he's disfigured from birth in the 19th century he would hide and he would below the the, the opera house and the only element of beauty in his life would be music and as horrible as he may seem on the outside, that's how beautiful he would be on the inside. It would be the beauty and the love of music. And so for me, he would become a, an elephant man type character, a Quasimodo type character. And I felt there was something universal in there in the sense that who among us doesn't feel that despite our, our outward imperfections, deep inside we mean well. And so taking that as the story, we invented his life, his backstory, and and that was the process by which I got into it. And I ended up writing a love letter to French music, a love letter to the Paris Opera, a love letter to the musical theater, and most importantly, a compelling character filled with a certain kind of wonderful pathos. And to be to really writing a show about the love of music. And that's really what that show became about for me. And, and that's why I think it's it's a big world. And it's nice to have two or three or four or five different versions of 
phantom, just as there are two or three or five different ballets based on Romeo and Juliet or, or Cinderella or Sleeping Beauty. And nobody has ever complained that there's too much good music in the world. That will never be a complaint. And so it was a joy to write that show. Do you have a ritual when it comes to writing songs? Like, do you write at a certain time of the day or in a I, certain place? I, I wish I could say I did, but I don't. There's no off switch for a composer. Music comes into your head sometimes when you're thinking about it and sometimes when you're not thinking about it. Sometimes when you're walking down the street. Sometimes you wake up with it in the middle of the night. Sometimes you're playing the piano. Sometimes you're just sitting with a piece of music paper and a pencil. And I think that's true with all the arts. I think a writer, a plot or a line or a character or a line of dialogue will occur to a dramatist or a novelist. And if you write it down and work on it, that makes you a poet, a novelist, a composer or a dramatist. And and so I don't really have – I mean I do know writers who do. I know some writers who won't have an appointment before 2 o'clock in the afternoon because that's their writing time. Now, I know that uh, Richard Rogers is famous for it, gotten to work early in the morning and then by 11 o'clock – if uh, he struck gold, he'd be moving on with it. And if not, he'd abandon it and go to work the next day. But I don't have a regime like that. I did an interview with a songwriter, and he told me that experiences and getting out there and living life is a great way to fill the well of inspiration. There's, there's no question about it. If you're a writer, you should read literature. You should study psychology. You should live a full existence because you're writing about people and their experiences, and how better to understand people and their experiences than by reading literature and by studying how people behave and also by immersing yourself in life and, and living it to the full, fullest and understanding the absolutely infinite variety of human emotions and situations that there can be. Because musicals in particular, all, they all grow from character. And every song has a persona. It's somebody who's singing it. If they're singing My Funny Valentine, that's a person. If it's singing, don't rain on my parade, that, that's a person. And so I think understand living, living life to the fullest, enjoying your family and your relationships is all, all flows into the writer who you are. What do you hope someone takes away from your music? Oh, hmm. I've never been asked that question. That's a great question. I think what I hope that somebody takes away from my music is the experience of having uh, having experienced the vitality of and the quickening of life that they sense life within the music and within the words or even just the pure music i always feel that way when i see a great painting when i see a great play when i hear a great piece of music when i see a great sculpture i always find that there's the reproduction of a genuine sense of life and vitality that's in it. It can be the energy in a line drawn by Picasso. It can be an incredible solo by John Coltrane or or it can be a Ella Fitzgerald. But it's it's the recreation of life in that form. I always hope that if somebody listening to my work, I will have connected with that person and the music will have connected them in the way that they experience an aspect of life that relates to their life, to their inner life. And that somehow enhances their lives because of it. Great answer. What are you working on right now? Uh, right now, I'm uh, actually just uh, completing a number of things. We just premiered, kind of historic, my ballet that I wrote and that was premiered in, in Kansas City, Missouri last week. And it, it's really the first full-length all-American three-act ballet in our history. No American has ever written a three-act, two intermission, all night long ballet based on an American subject matter. I wrote Tom Sawyer, choreographed by an American choreographer, William Whitener, and presented by American Company at the um, Kaufman Center for the uh, Performing Arts in Kansas City. And it was a thrill beyond a thrill. I been I got the idea many years ago and wonderful collaborators and, and right now I'm now preparing the score for print and, and at the same time I'm just got finished working on uh, the cast album of the show that we just put on off-Broadway in New York, Death Takes a Holiday. And I guess in the offing, that's something that I'm still writing, is I've been asked by an American company that's working with the government of the People's Republic of China, and they've asked me to help create a musical that will be produced in Beijing 
which is based on, I guess, the great a great Chinese opera from the 16th century, which is their national Romeo and Juliet story. And it's really almost like a fairy tale. And that is a great experience because it's cross-cultural. And I feel that anything that we can do to enhance international understanding is a good thing. I remember growing up and, and having, you know, watching Louis Armstrong go to the Soviet Union as an ambassador of goodwill. And I feel that this is the same sort of thing. If we can bring American musical theater to to that country, and it's just a wonderful reflection of mutual understanding. And, and of course, it's it's challenging for me to write something that's translated into Mandarin and just a great learning experience. In terms of musical theater, who do you think are the greatest living songwriters and the greatest songwriters of yesteryear? Well, obviously, I mean, it's, you know, it's a no-brainer having been coronated now at his 70th and 80th birthday, and well-deservedly, I think anybody would say that the greatest living practitioner of musical theater on the planet is Stephen Sondheim. He's a remarkable, remarkable man and a remarkable lyricist and a remarkable composer responsible for creating so many inspiring masterpieces. So I think that's a that's a really easy answer. In terms of greatest living songwriters generally, in addition to Stephen Sondheim, unquestionably you would have to say Paul McCartney. The impact of the compositional output and lyrical output of the Beatles changed history. We're now into the fifth generation. I mean, my 11-year-old daughter loves the Beatles, and I and I loved the Beatles when I was younger, and it will never stop. So I think you would have to recognize those two as being sort of extraordinary progenitors of uh, of masterpieces who really impacted and changed the history of uh, the history of songwriting. What was the other question? One was one was musical theater, and one was songwriting generally. No, I said uh, no, I yeah. said songwriting of today, and then I said of yesteryear. Right. Well, they're both of today and yesterday. That's interesting. Yeah. Uh, if I were going to go backwards and say great songwriters of yesterday, it would have to be Irving Berlin and George Gershwin and Ira as well. The great, great, great songwriters of the Golden Age, Jerome Kern. These are these are the titans who literally gave us and, and created our language of American popular song and musical theater. Earl Darlin, Sammy Fain, I mean, these are, you know, Frank Lesser, Julie Stein, these are, these are extraordinary names, and they, they created the music, the sonic universe, which is American music. What is the best thing about being Maury Yeston? <laughs> the best thing about being Maury Eston is having my wonderful wife and children. No, no questions about it. I like to say, as important as one's inner life is, you can have a flop show and a hit life. And I think it's important never to forget that. At the end of the day, it's the people who surround you. It's the people who you love. It's the people who are important to you, your friends, your parents, your family. That's really your life. And your work will have its ups and have its downs. And I think what's lucky about my work is that I've always known that I was a composer. It's a calling. So I never had to wonder what to do with my life. I always knew. And so there's an unbroken line between who I was when I was 10 years old and when I was in college and who I am now. I'm still the same guy sitting in a room or with a piano and making up words and music. But I would have to say that still has to be second to my actual life. That's the best answer I could give you there. Well, for my last question, yeah. for anyone who hears our interview, do you have any parting words of wisdom? Oh, absolutely. If my example has any meaning at all, it's absolutely follow what instinctually you feel is your dream and don't give up. You don't always get to where you want to go, but you must never abandon what you love, and what's important to you. You may not make a living from it. I didn't know that I was going to make a living or from writing musicals, but I knew I wanted to write them. And so I, I had a, you know, we call it a day gig. I mean, I became a teacher, and I, I loved teaching as much as I love writing. But I would say, especially to young people, now is the time to try what it is that you want to do, because you're really too young to make a mistake. At the age of 22, you can try something for three years, and then when you're 25, abandon it and do something else. And it's okay. 
You don't have to play it safe. If there's something you really want to go for, for goodness sakes, go for it. That's the best advice I could give. Well, Maury, thank you so much for this interview. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thank you. I loved your questions, and I enjoyed chatting with you.